I think small practices at the moment that all find themselves working at a distance um, for the first time and what can be achieved even at a distance and how that we went about still utilizing local craftsmen and manufacturers. Um, and it is also a lovely site. It's a site full of contradictions. It, in the image you see at the moment, it appears leafy, which it is leafy and secluded, but it is also um, one of its boundaries is one of the busiest roads in, Lon in London going into Surrey. But it is also um, a lovely little Victorian cottage that's full of textures and tones, albeit nearly fallen down. And it has a wonderful sense of history. It is always known as Warren Cottage and it was one of the original gate lodges to Richmond Park. It was the residence of the Marquis of Donegal and the uh, Prince of Wales at the time was a frequent visitor, so we're told. Um, it's also a building of Townscape Mert and it sits within a conservation area. Um, most of the trees on site were uh, protected by TPOs. So as you can see, there was um, lots of little constraints to it, which was um, really good to work with. So I'll show to you in relation to its setting. Um, you can, that's Richmond Kingston Hill Road, which is a very busy road. To the top left of the screen, you'll see Richmond Park. And then Warren Road, which the project is based on, is a, is a private gated road. And then it's kind of all large. You can see um, Coombe Wolf Golf, Coombe Wood Golf Course down at the bottom um, right-hand side. It's an area all um, large. I'd say um, Warren Cottage was probably the smallest house by far within the area. Um, they're very large private residents um, along that road. So in about 2012, we were approached in a very roundabout way to have a look at this project. Um, the clients, one was Spanish and one was Northern Irish. They had previously had an um, extension designed for the site and had come to Northern Ireland to look for a timber frame company. Um, we had actually not worked with the timber frame company, but they, we were recommended um, that they come and speak to us before they build what they have permission for. So that was the kind of start of the project. When we went to visit the cottage, it was in very, it doesn't appear too bad in this photograph, but on inspection, it was really bad. The 1930s rare extension was just, you know, single leaf, single um, glazing, no insulation, no damp proofing. Um, and the original cottage was the same. It needed um, faces, windows, doors, rewiring, um, re-plumbing. Again, no insulation, floor screens needed um, redoing roof tiles missing wall tiles missing kind of the list went on and on and it, it really was um a two up two down cottage so the cottage is quite dainty so as we all do um you, you start your design process um sketching on bits of paper or whatever and then we produced up into a model so and at the time the site was going to be split into two for two for an extension to the cottage and then for a, a second dwelling um, and it was always a long shot because because of the area and they wanted to protect the larger sites um, and in the end we pulled the second one out of planning and actually made a garden room onto the original so the footprint on site is almost yeah. almost the same as if it was the two dwellings. Um, you can see to the top um, top the, this the entrance into the site, and one of the main things we wanted was to create that that first impression that you got when you came in, and it was just the, the, the kind of sweet little cottage sitting there. So we always wanted the cottage 
even though we knew it was going to be smaller than the extension, we still wanted it to be the main focal point on the site. So the entrance was always going to um, stay in the original front door and into the little cottage. And then we wanted, albeit larger, the extension to feel um, subservient to it and to almost backlight the, the cottage and highlight it. It also allowed us to kind of create a, a buffer to um, the traffic on Kingston Hill because a double-decker bus or the buses just pull up right outside it. So we didn't want any overlooking in, in the wall. So we pulled it slightly enough the boundary. So it gave us between two meters and two and a half meters to replant that boundary. And so kind of cushion it against Kingston Hill. And then it allowed us to open out to the garden, which was um, east face, getting the east light into the kitchen in the morning and then getting the nice evening light in. And you have to remember when you're working London, Surrey direction, your, your, your summers are a lot nicer than what we're used to here. So the idea then was you came in through the main cottage and the two rooms downstairs have or, um, designated as home office and kind of a little snug um, room for, um, for the kind of the couple to escape to so, and the boys could have kind of the, the main living area off the kitchen. So you come through into a kind of through a into a glass and timber and concrete extension, and you have, as you can see, very simply, uh, kitchen, dining, and your living space down to the the south. In behind the kitchen, you had utility areas and um, a, a downstairs bedroom that was for visiting relatives um, from Spain or for the au pair, and it meant that that bedroom was slightly private to the rest of the family accommodation. And then if you, out to the, the right-hand side of the screen, we created a, a garden cinema room gym, um, mostly to be used by um, three young boys growing up there. Um, quickly go to the first floor. Again, the two, uh, two rooms upstairs in the cottage were just um, made good and a, a bathroom added. And then above in the first floor of the new extension, we have two new two bedrooms with um, a small shared shower room and then a master bedroom um, to the east. Uh, as I spoke earlier about the textures and the tones, we, we felt we had to, um, albeit subtly, we, we had to add to that rather than just putting a white box beside it. it. It just felt too stark with the materials that were there originally. So we started looking at um, concrete and board marking the concrete. So it would give us the banding, if you like, of the original tile first floor and, and the lower um, red brick coursing. And also then we would bring in the timber to give us the warmth of the original tile and the original brick. And uh, back up, um, this is what, as well, we had design around the trees. So as, as that kind of dictated a certain amount um, where we created little courtyards, if you like. So you can see in this one, the kind of the evening courtyard, it's all around an existing tree. That was, yeah, it was a mulberry tree. And then we start looking at the um, materials with our clients and getting samples. So you can see the boardmark concrete, the Oroco being used for the glue lamps and cladding. And then we went about um, getting samples done up so we have a different looks at the outcomes of the moulds and then choose one. And this allowed us that even though we were here in Northern Ireland, we still had really good control over the materials that we were using. And all the, the, the concrete panels were, were obviously produced here in Northern Ireland and they were all packed onto the lorry in order that when they came off, then it was like almost building flat pack on site and everything came off in order that it was going to be erected. 
So this is, uh, as yeah. you can see, site work starting. So we, we actually, the only person from England that worked in the job is the groundworks person did foundations up to subfloor level. Absolutely everybody else came from Northern Ireland and travelled over. Um, this was mainly to keep budget down um, and it sort of worked fine. This day, the, the phone man here was, it was about 35 degrees this day and it was, it was just crazy. The phone man was <laughs> struggling on site. Um, yeah, so he, he took it up to the subfloor level and slab level. Um, and we did sort of fortnightly inspections, as did the structure engineer who was Northern Irish as well. Um, and then we got to the stage where we get the concrete walls all delivered. Um, within two days, basically, the building was pretty much standing. Um, so you'll see here, it was all like 150 concrete panels, all made locally. I say, Balmain Company made these. And we stood them up. And we built like Lego insulation out around them and stood the outer, outer plane up. Um, so it went together. This was probably about half a day's work here so far. And the outer skin was gone up. Um, so you can see it proceeded quite quickly. Um, I spent about three days inside myself at this stage, just making sure there was no hiccups. Um, and then again, this timber frame blew down the wall made in Northern Ireland and shipped over as was stated. So it was all, it was all component up. We did really tight schedules, approved all the steel, actually got it onto lorries, did the same with the glue lambs, um, window frames as well all came from here. So everything came, nothing was sight measured, um, apart from the glass at the final stage. Um, and everything just directed up and went in and fitted without any any problem, <laughs> luckily. Um, so it sort of gives you the feel of, the, of what we were creating, the link, and even the louver panels all came, and cedar all came. And the glass, the glass also came from Ireland, um, was fitted. Um, just keep flicking through these, so it's all pretty, all pretty standard. The um, plasters come over as well. <laughs> uh, our, our, our client, um, John, was Northern Irish and he absolutely loved it because everybody was from home and poor Amelia, who was Spanish, understood Dobity and um, she was really funny about it. She said it was like being going back to Northern Ireland every time she went to site. So it just gives you a feel for what we created. The finishes inside now are a bit different than we would probably have liked. Um, cedar cladding was all stepped, so it would sort of tie in with brick and sort of give it a bit of texture that will or naturally. Um, and you can see it here. The paving all came over as well. It was all laid by the contractor. And then with these sort of slatted sort of link between the house and the garden room. And they just kind of gave it, you know, just it, it gave a physical connection between the garden room and the house. Some more finished shots. And now uh, this is one of the only photographs we actually had from Kingston Hill, but now the, the planting has taken over and the, the timber has really grayed in behind it. So you actually see nothing from Kingston Hill and the finished product from the gated entrance. And you, as you can see, the, the cottage is still the focus. And at night, the extension, because of the, the louvers on front and it's lit up, it really just glows in behind and backlights the original house. We managed to retain this tree as well. And it's now just taller way up above the house again and sort of encloses sort of the three little sort of private areas. And it really is just, you know, it's um in in within the area it is, it is a very, it's a very modest home. Um and I think our clients really bought it, even though it was so small, really, because it it gave their boys um a garden and somewhere to play. And again, this is this is in the garden room, which they use as a cinema room and a gym. And there's a pool, that external pool that links the two also. And that kind of gives you an idea of again, finishes inside, exposed concrete. Um, 
and which, paint it timber. We tried to limit the wet trades in sight, which was one of the big things from the beginning, just trying to keep it that the good flat pack most of the building. The main, main reason for that was to try to keep the cost down. Um, because the original plan the client had was coming about one and a half million, but we managed to get all this done for in around the 800,000 mark, um, which made it 400 square meters for that of an extension and renovation. So we were pretty chuffed at the end. And that, that's, that's all we have prepared, I'm afraid. That's it with the images. Can you hear me, Kerry? I can hear you. Yeah. I was just wondering if the room was going to come back in there. Okay, sorry. I was just eating, actually. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I, yeah. Must, yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jessica and Stephen. Uh, yeah, that was fantastic. Um, I really like the way you uh, threw your focus on the construction and designing all the construction details um, up front uh, had reduced the cost and uh, improved the efficiency. And it's something that I think um, is really where the future lies for a lot of, um, you know, of architecture uh, going forward. Uh, we do need to improve the efficiency of construction. And I think that is a perfect example of how that can be done. Um, and I think it's very impressive and it's a beautiful scheme. Thank <laughs> I you. really like it. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions or want to make any comments? Uh, Dool, I, I um, sorry, I see Alan's got his hand up, but I'll just steal in before him. Um, so here, did you say that it was it was the, a former house of the Marquis of Donegal? Yeah. So this sort this this crazy Northern Irish connection. Yes. Followed oh, through. Yeah. Get everywhere. Right? Yeah, totally. So the Marquis of Donegal owned it, and and obviously Belfast, like massively, you know, the connection is enormous. And then this guy, the guy who owned it, was from Northern Ireland. Yeah, well, he actually he actually bought it from an English lady. He he was walking past one weekend and really liked it, and just knocked the door. And said to her if she was ever selling. No way. And he was in with his, he was walking two of his kids, I think we were quite young, and she took to him. And about a year later, she rang him up to say that she was going to sell and want to give him first opportunity. That's amazing. Yeah. And then pretty much the whole thing was made either here or, or across the island anyway. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it was all made between Balamina and Balamina and Kilray, really. Yeah. And, and the windows yeah. came from Banbridge, but. I was probably the furthest thing away from our office. Yeah, and have you repeated that again? Have you ever done that again where you've had everything so, um, so much prefabricated? Not not as much now at the moment. We, we, we do quite a bit, but not as much as that. At the beginning we set up practice, we did a lot of self builds. Um, a lot of our clients were professionals, but now, now they're the only ones who can afford to build, probably as professionals, solicitors, doctors, lawyers, you know, barristers, wherever you go. Like it's, it's very little plumbers or. Yeah, so they, they're more tending to go down the contractor route rather than the, the self build route where we, you know, coordinated the package and brought all the people into it. So, yeah. Change in that respect. We, we still do a lot of timber frame flat packing, timber steel frame, and cladding packages and window packages. And normally there's a main contractor that takes that all on board, but we would control, we would not sort of nominate them people in. Yes. Um, it's actually become a wee bit more popular again because bill costs around the very south of Ireland, Cork, Mayo even, very expensive, like it'd be twice the price of up here. Yeah. Cork would actually be probably more expensive than Dublin for houses really? um, to build, yeah. Um, the guy, the client must have just been over the moon whenever you came back with a, uh, price like not that far off half yeah or shame our fee didn't reflect on that <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you're, you definitely deserved your fee there <laughs> it, was, it was a it was a tough one for the fee now that one i don't think there was much money made there <laughs> okay 
So that's typically, it was one of them projects when you were approached about it, you probably bid too low because you wanted to get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, but sometimes it's worth doing that, you know, it's, you're doing what you do for the joy of it. It's not just purely about yeah. the money, or, yeah, you know, no. your bank balance. And I think if you were in it just for that, well, the work you'd be doing would be quite boring a lot of the time, you know. So I think, that, you know, sometimes it's um, good for the soul to to decide to do and just for the love of it and the joy of it. Yeah, and if you make some money on the side, that's yeah. a bonus. It's a yeah. bonus. Yeah. Sorry, Alan. Sorry for jumping in there. No, no. Uh, well, Karen, you covered actually most of what I was going to say, just in terms of, um, although Jessica and Stephen, you were saying it's quite an old project for you, obviously, uh, very much on today's agenda is the issue of um, off-site fabrication, you know, um, quality control, um, uh, and also uh, architects and contractors stroke subcontractors working closely together. So although it's maybe uh, old in your books, it's actually um, very uh, still a very good showcase of the issues and the way that I think people are trying to move. You know, yeah. and, 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 <laughs> I've, I've always been a fan of trying to do stuff flat pack, but big, big Irish thing, you probably know from working here, Sullivan, everybody wants concrete or solid, no timber walls. You want everything when you bang your head against it, you get split. I can. So it's, it's, it's harder to convince people. I, I think, I, I think like, um, even we're doing social housing now, it's very hard to get them to go down a flat pack route. They want, you know, they have all their standard way, even how they joint their bricks. Like, you know, they're, they're very hard to get around a lot of these companies have a really suit to go down that line. But not, not every site suits that. Like, you need to the right site. The main thing that London was, was for us to control it and for us to try to control price. Because we knew if we get a London guy going into one of these sites that's worth two, three million quid, like the first thing you do is they double or triple their price because you think the person's rushing with loads of millions to spend. So it's... Our client wasn't in that position. He he had, he was managed to get the property, but that he, he pumped his money into it. So it sort of led him down the Northern Irish route because he thought everybody was going to be cheaper for him. So. Uh, if I could add as well, the, um, I, I think what it also demonstrates is, is that how our industry here in Northern Ireland is doing work elsewhere. You know, that uh, if we were to wind the clock back 20, 30 years ago, there was very little being done elsewhere. But now, you know, you know, you and others in the room listening to this are all doing work elsewhere, and that's you know, um, yeah. for us. Well, to actually, we work more out of Northern Ireland than in Northern Northern Ireland. We're probably twenty percent Northern Ireland at the moment, and and eighty percent outside. So, you know, the lessons we learned ten years ago, even more of working at it at a distance, distance, really. You know, there were in hindsight, you couldn't, you know, we couldn't have had better for the last year. <laughs> Because we we had the experience of that, so really, other than sites closing, you know, yeah, we were used to working at a distance with contractors and not being on site. So even now, if the site was down the road and you couldn't get there because of restrictions, you, we still have the experience of how to deal with that and communicate with contractors and clients they think the problem, that aren't on your doorstep which the, is the, pro the problem we really have when we go to deal with uh, the government body projects like uh, social housing or any of these schools you know you, everybody just writes contractor design so you don't you just draw two lines and you say contractor design and give us this performance you know which when you deal, deal with houses all the time and there's no such thing you have to detail absolutely everything and I think that's what stands you well when you if you're working at this distance, if everything's absolutely detailed up and you get a good contractor in, you're not going to have really any questions. Um, or you're not you're not going to have any real issues if it's the right contractor. But we find any of this contractor design stuff just leads to all all sorts of problems in the in the social housing end that we're involved in anyway, like because it's a fight down to the bottom too the worst detail possible or the cheapest detail possible to create, you know. Um, if I, if I, chip in, I think the direction of travel in England anyway is in the opposite direction, post Grenfell, and how um, contractors and the, the likes of the CLC, the Construction Leadership Council, have been given lots of opportunity to change the culture and they haven't. So um, 
let's just to everybody in the room just watch this space i think there's going to be um leaving contractors to make decisions i think is going to be um a certain amount a thing of the past i agree entirely i think the move uh towards design and build um was a red great step and uh they're definitely the pendulum is swinging the other way now uh but in particularly what i like is the involvement with the the subcontractors um you know the people and actually manufacturing the concrete panels actually manufacturing the uh the timber glue lamb beams and things like that because they're the people with the expertise uh in their product the main contractors actually have very minimal grasp sometimes of that and main contractors are fantastic at logistics and organization but their their expertise does not lie in the construction detailing and the early design upfront early design uh, and full design by architects is the way to drive efficiency well we have come across a problem recently not even with contractors or subcontractors mainly the engineers structural engineers you introduce glue lamb or timber frame they, they even for a house the right contractor designed on it you're going no 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 we need to design it we want to tell them what's going in there so we can get a price that's identical from each one because then you end up going to five timber frame companies and five totally different products with five totally different prices but it's very hard to get engineers to design timber frames and glue lambs are they're very reluctant they just want to build their pi is stopping them doing that it's about trying to offload the risk from themselves. So we found that now in the last five or six projects, really the timber frame rate has been a nightmare, um, particularly when you get the prices. Are there any other questions or comments? <clears throat> Just I, I well, before you go, I just like yes, Martin, Martin, um, Jessica. Probably architects here who have watched that and have to say it was a fabulous scheme. But I think what burns out very, very strongly from your presentation is the passion that you have for it, right? And it's it's something that I think in public procurement often. It's often missed, and that's why I think maybe you go down the route of design and build quite often. They don't realize just the additional value architecture per day at no cost. You said you did that project and maybe you didn't make a lot of money on it. Obviously, there's other projects you do make money on, that's how you're in business. But but the, your, the way you spoke about that, Dalton, I would say a lot of architecture on this feel the same. And, uh, if given, if given the opportunity, you'll work longer and work harder and more dedicated and government contracts on time to recognize. And if they set it up, they can tap in to a huge amount of that enthusiasm. And that's really what burns out. It, it, there, there's a classic expression about caring, just caring about what you do. And it, if you care what you do, it, it expresses itself in the quality of what you do. That's really what came across. So well done. Thank you. Thanks. If there are no other comments or questions, um, I'd just like to thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's fantastic and really interesting. And apologies for <laughs> forgetting about you. I was so concentrating on getting through the meeting. We were, quite, we were getting sort of quite relieved. There was a reason I escaped. <laughs> okay, well, sorry. It's, you you get focused much. on the front of your nose and you, you forget okay. everything else. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, bye. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, thank you. That was great. Cheers, thank you.